I do think it's time to stop changing the clocks. Ditch the switch. Today, the push to end spring forward fall back. But which one do we keep? A local congressman and sleep expert weigh in. The riots in Philadelphia two summers ago, I stopped those riots. Meet the candidate. Today we hear from former U.S. Attorney Bill McSwain. He's hoping to snag the Republican nomination for Pennsylvania's top job. And mail theft. NBC 10's Tracy Davidson tracked down multiple stolen checks for sale on the dark web and alerted the original owners how you can protect yourself. NBC 10 at Issue starts now. Good morning and welcome to NBC 10 at Issue. I'm NBC 10's Lauren Make. We begin with daylight saving time and if the time switch will stick around. If you're feeling a little sleepy right now, it's because you've lost an hour of sleep. Daylight saving time is when we spring forward and push the clocks ahead. The benefit comes with an extra hour of sunlight at the end of the day. Well, now there's a push by some lawmakers to end springing forward and falling back altogether. Last week, lawmakers held a hearing on the issue. It was led by New Jersey Congressman Frank Pallone, who chairs the House Energy and Commerce Committee. He believes it's time to stop changing the clocks. The issue is, should we stay with daylight saving or stick with standard time? The bottom line is that daylight savings time is good for business and commerce across the United States, and our industry urges you to keep it in place. The Society for Research on Biological Rhythms and the Sleep Research Society, all of whom support permanent standard time as the healthy choice. Congressman Frank Pallone joins me now. Well, as the Energy and Commerce Chairman, you recently held a hearing looking into the possibility of changing the changing back and forth and making a permanent switch to either standard or daylight saving time. First of all, what did you learn from that hearing? Well, we learned that the switch itself twice a year is probably the most damaging. In other words, there are a lot of people whose health is impacted, productivity and work is impacted, uh, kids are impacted in terms of, you know, uh, going to school and being prepared. Um, and so I think that it's clear that, this, that having to switch back and forth is, uh, is really the biggest problem. And that's what I would like to eliminate. I, I don't think we were able to resolve, you know, whether we have daylight savings time all year or Eastern Standard Time, I mean, or Standard Time all year, or perhaps even, uh, you know, uh, split the baby, so to speak, and, you know, have a, a permanent time that's half hour in between, which some people have suggested. But Is the, that an the, option? Is that something that you could actually do, sort of split that difference? Oh, sure. I mean, we could essentially do whatever we think is beneficial. Um, but, I mean, the consensus clearly is that having this switch twice a year is what's really causing the problem because, uh, you know, all those things that are health or productivity related uh, and also with kids going to school. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, that you think that the switch is actually bad for the economy. Explain that. Well, I mean, there's the there's a loss of productivity. Um, there is um, uh, evidence that, uh, you know, people, for example, uh, if, you know, they'll go to they'll go to work and spend more time uh, just doing personal things on the computer rather than actually working, you know, those types of things. OK, um, you know, the, the American Academy of Sleep believes that staying on standard time is the best option because standard time more closely aligns with daily rhythms of the body's internal clock. How do you sort of balance that with the the, the other interests as well? Well, it's going to be difficult because, as you know, I mean, for example, I represent uh, part of my districts, the Jersey Shore. Right. And a lot of the Floridians, for example, in tourism economies want to have uh, wanted to be light later uh, because I guess people that are on vacation are more likely to get up later and want to stay out later. Right. So they're advocates for that. On the other hand, um, you know, many uh, parents are worried that if uh, if they um, if it's dark uh, or it lasts or stays darker longer in the morning uh, when uh, the kids have to go to school, that that presents problems in terms of getting them up or even, you know, or even getting to school for security reasons. So, you know, this is, is a difficult, it's difficult to figure out if we got rid of going back and forth and switching twice a year, what we replace it with. What happens now after you've had this hearing? What are the next steps to um, determine 
which way to go and if you can get enough people on board to do that. Well, we on a you know this hearing was bipartisan, and I want to stress that. And and on a bipartisan basis, myself and and my equivalent uh, Republican leader have actually asked the Department of Transportation uh, to do an analysis about you know whether we if we switch to just daylight saving times um, all year round. So we're basically this was sort of a beginning of our effort to try to find out and get more studies about uh, what the impact would be. Uh, more so about, as you say, you know, using standard time all year round, using daylight savings time all year round. I, I think there's a consensus that the switching is not good. I, I keep repeating that, but I do think that that is the consensus. And so now the, the question really is, if we were to get rid of the switching, um, what do we replace it with? And trying to get as much information as possible about the impact of keeping one uh, time versus the other or possibly splitting it, as I said. I know you said your hearing was bipartisan and there has been bipartisan discussion uh, about this, but how, how likely do you think it is that people can all come to an agreement, that you and your colleagues could all come to an agreement on this? Well, I, I really want to stress that this is bipartisan and, I, and that would have to be. In other words, it would have to be an agreement um, you know, amongst Democrats and Republicans overwhelmingly in order to make this change. And again, the problem isn't the idea of getting rid of the switch twice a year, but what to replace it with. Supporters of keeping daylight saving time year round say it is the best choice. They say more sunlight saves lives, it reduces crime, and it saves energy, and that it's a boost for business and recreational services. But the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has a different take. They support a switch to permanent standard time. With me now is Philip Gearman. He is an associate professor of clinical psychology at Penn Medicine. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So explain to me, why do some sleep doctors believe that standard time is the way to go here? So a lot of it is based on the, the assumption that our, our bodies could have developed and evolved in the context of no daylight savings time. And so our kind of in body's internal clock is really designed to be synchronized with kind of an, an unaltered schedule outside. So the argument is that if we followed, say, for example, permanent daylight savings time, then we're really not in sync with, with the way what our body is developed for. Don't our bodies just eventually get used to whatever the time is? You know, most people, like you said, within a few days can uh, adjust without too much difficulty. The issue is the twofold. One, within those few days, uh, there's increased rates of car accidents, you know, increased heart attacks. I mean, it's, it's, it can, it, a lot of people suffer uh, significant consequences just in those first few days. But then there are other individuals for whom it, they, they don't really adjust very well. And uh, it can take sometimes even up to a few weeks for some people. For folks who may be sort of struggling with the time change now, what can you do to make things a little bit easier on yourself? So one of the strongest cues for kind of keeping our body in sync with the environment is just bright light exposure. And uh, so one of the best things to do is to get outdoors, to, to get some sunlight and do that ideally for a few days, at least a half hour a day. Uh, and that can really help to speed up the process of getting uh, adjusted to that one hour difference. All right, Philip Gearman, a psychologist with Penn Medicine. Thanks so much for being here with us. Next on NBC 10 at Issue, meet the candidate. Bill McSwain weighs in on why he thinks he should get your vote for Pennsylvania governor. Now to our special series, Meet the Candidate, your chance to hear from the men and women running for office in our area. Today we hear from former U.S. Attorney Bill McSwain. He's seeking the Republican nomination for Pennsylvania governor. McSwain is a former U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. He lives in Chester County and he was appointed by former President Donald Trump as U.S. Attorney. He says as governor, his priorities will include reducing crime and promoting school choice. Other Republicans vying for Pennsylvania's top job include former Congressman Lou Barletta, State Senator Jake Corman, political consultant Charlie Giroux, State Senator Doug Mastriano, and Delaware County businessman Dave White. They're looking to face Democrat Josh Shapiro. He's currently Pennsylvania's attorney general. I recently met up with McSwain during a campaign stop in Mayfair. Why should you be Pennsylvania's governor? 
I should be the governor because I love Pennsylvania and public service is in my blood and I can get things done. I'm not a career politician. People know that this is my first run for public office, which I think is a plus. Um, because we need an outsider to do the things in Harrisburg that need to get done to improve people's lives. You have talked a lot about crime. You've talked about yourself as a law and order candidate. But you, you did have a law enforcement position in this city, and crime was bad then, too. So why could you not make a bigger dent in it? I did make a big dent when you talk about the riots. Okay, the riots in Philadelphia two summers ago, I stopped those riots. But you were concerned about homicides at that time. You and I talked about it. I know you were concerned about things like that. Uh, but the crime continued while you held that position. Well, Larry Krasner has completely abdicated his responsibilities. And I stepped into that breach. I stepped into that void in order to try to provide uh, public safety to the law-abiding citizens. And I think I did that. I did a lot of good as U.S. Attorney, not only when it came to the riots, stopping injection sites, putting violent criminals in jail, uh, punishing people for corruption, but also look at what's happened to the city in 21. Things are bad, but things can always get worse. It's no coincidence that once I stepped down as U.S. Attorney in January 21, what happened the rest of 21? Record shootings, record homicides. Things got a lot worse. You've talked about being willing to send in the National Guard or the state police to Philadelphia. Um, what would they do? Well, everything's on the table, first of all, okay? So you have police resources at your disposal as governor. But you would could, you just you send them in just on an ordinary weekend, or are you saying if something specific happens? In the areas like Kensington, the areas that are really in crisis, where the police feel like they have no sort of chance, they're just fighting this terrible uphill battle, you could temporarily bring in the National Guard to reset things. And, and what would they do? What would they actually do on scene? They could literally patrol. They could literally come to the neighborhoods and be a deterrent and be a presence and saying that there's not going to be, uh, there's not going to be a situation where crimes are committed and you're not arrested. You talked about having a constitutional amendment in Pennsylvania to have the governor appoint the district attorney in Philadelphia. Obviously, you have a long history with Larry Krasner, but if there were to be another city that elects a district attorney that you disagree with, would you want to appoint the district attorney in that city? I think the most important thing is to focus on here and focus on Philadelphia for that state constitutional amendment. And I also think that the people in Philadelphia would support it. They're not happy with Krasner. The people in Philadelphia elected Larry Krasner twice. A very small percentage of the people in Philadelphia elected Larry Krasner in the Democratic primary. And because you have the kind of uh, voter patterns here, usually the primary but is the game. But those are the voters who live here. Those are the voters who, the people who vote in primaries tend to be more ideological and they tend to agree with, with Krasner's approach, but it's a very small percentage of people. 85% of the people in Philadelphia are not happy with Larry Krasner. He was elected by 15%, a very small percentage. And a state constitutional amendment would also give Philadelphia a voice, right? This is something that all of the, the residents and the citizens could vote But the, of the voice state of could those in Philadelphia on. would be outweighed just in sheer numbers by the voices in other parts of the state. You know, I think I'm going to do very well in Philadelphia in the voting for governor, okay? And people should know that part of my platform is when you vote for me, when a Philadelphian goes to the polls in November and vote for me, I'm going to get rid of Larry Krasner. Let's stay on the issue of voting. Did you find significant or widespread fraud during the 2020 election? I received lots of allegations of, of different irregularities when I was U.S. Attorney in November of, of 2020. How many? Well, there were allegations coming in from lots of different people, but some are small, some are large. They're all, all different varieties. I can't comment necessarily about non-public in, uh, investigations, but I can tell you in general, receive lots of uh, reports. But those are just allegations, right? Those aren't actual proof. Anybody can allege something, and your job as a prosecutor is to go and investigate and see if there's actually any, um, any documented uh, cases of election fraud or election uh, Did you find any? Irreg irregularities. I was not given the freedom, the free reign to investigate fully the way I wanted to. And that's why I uh, communicated to President Trump in the letter that you're aware mm -hmm. of, where I said that 
I was told to refer cases to the state attorney general, and I disagreed with that. I didn't think that was the right approach, but I didn't have the free reign to investigate like I wish I had had. Attorney General Bill Barr has disputed your version of events. Why should people believe your version as opposed to the former attorney general's? I have a lifetime reputation for honesty and integrity. Everything in my letter to the president is 100% true. I stand by it. And um, I'm, I have more important things to worry about than, than what Bill Barr is, is, is saying about the matter. Is Bill I'm Barr worried lying? About, I'm worried is about- Is the former attorney general lying? Bill Barr is mistaken. Okay. Mistaken, so he's, he's confused? He is mistaken, and he might not be aware of all the details of what was happening in Philadelphia and the surrounding area when I was U.S. attorney. So just to, to button up the 2020 election, do you believe that the 2020 election was legitimate and that Joe Biden won the presidency legitimately in Pennsylvania and in the general election? Again, I'm focused on the future, but I will but you say... you were U.S. attorney at the time. I will say this. It's very interesting that the Commonwealth Court recently ruled that no excuse mail-in balloting violates our Pennsylvania Constitution and is unconstitutional. So um, what difference would that have made in 2020? Nobody would really know, right? We can't go back to 2020 and we, vote under a we different... We can't, but right. in terms of what happened, do you believe that that was a legitimate election? I believe that the Commonwealth Court is right. I believe that it was unconstitutional for us to have no excuse mail-in balloting. Have you spoken with President Trump about your candidacy? Uh, I have spoken to the president, yes. And what did he want to know from you? He's very interested in Pennsylvania. He's very um, interested in the election. He's following it closely. I don't know if he's going to uh, take a role in it or not. I don't. It's up to him whether he's going to endorse somebody. Did he indicate that he might or that um, he would? I think he's still trying to make up his mind, and that's up to him. I mean, he's going to do it based on his own timeline, based on uh, what he what he wants to do. Um, I don't have any influence over that, but I will say that I was proud to serve as his United States attorney in his administration. Do you think that school districts should be able to decide whether to impose a mask mandate? If you want to wear a mask in school or you as a parent are, are more comfortable having your, your kids wear a mask in school, that's fine. But parents should have the option of not having their children wear masks in school. So they, school districts should not be allowed to make that decision on a local level? They shouldn't be able to jam it down people's throat. Stay with NBC10 at issue as we bring you more of the candidates running for office during Decision 2022. Next on NBC10 at issue, stolen mail. It's happening all over our area. Find out what happens to the mail after it's taken. When you mail a check for, say, your utility bill, you expect it to get to the company and be cashed. What you don't expect is for it to be stolen. NBC10's Tracy Davidson got a hold of checks being sold on the dark web and tracked them back to their original owners. From door to door, NBC10 responds, tracked down the owners of checks mailed but not arriving at the desired destination. Instead, delivered to the dark web. You're going to be glad that we're here or not, but you need to know this. Denise recognized this check. She says she mailed it in this post office blue collection box. It's just around the corner from her home. This check was stolen. Oh, really? So what they do with it? When we told her it was for sale on the dark web. And which would you like to hear about? All checks or a specific check? She quickly checked to see if it had been cashed. It wasn't, so she canceled the check. It says they're open. The flock at Christlike PG Faith Baptist Church didn't have time to cancel two checks found on the dark web before a crook used them. So I saw all these checks that was written. Red flag. You didn't write them? No, mm -mm. It's a different person name. Reviewing the church's bank records, trustee William Brown had already discovered many fraudulent checks. They made up their own check using our rally number and account number on the bottom of the line. Brown's quick visit to the bank kept the funds in the church's coffers. Those two examples, as well as others we tracked down, are part of a growing trend of stolen mail ending up on the dark web. Now, the people we talked with didn't lose money. But their information is now out there. Their bank account information, their routing number, and every bit of information that thieves have on you helps them to steal your identity. It's staggering 
David Maimon is the director of the evidence-based research group at Georgia State University. Only between December 2021 and January 2022, we see a 100% increase in the volume of stolen checks across the United States. Uh, for Pennsylvania, uh, we see a 100% increase as well uh, over those two months period. Maimon's interdisciplinary researchers monitor 60 channels on the dark web and easily found these checks written by people from Philadelphia for sale. He shared a few we returned for this story. My mom says personal checks can sell for $120 to $175. Business checks, about $250, less if you buy in batches. Also for sale, arrow keys for as much as $7,000. Arrow keys are universal keys mail carriers use to open those mailboxes and collect the mail. These can give thieves easy access to your mail. Tracy Davidson, NBC10 News. Now, the Postal Inspection Service tells NBC10, quote, every day the U.S. Postal Service safely and efficiently delivers millions of checks, money orders, credit cards, and merchandise. Unfortunately, such items are also attractive to thieves, and that is why postal inspectors across the country are at work to protect your mail. Now, just a reminder, when using one of those blue postal collection boxes, don't drop off mail after the last collection of the day. The collection times are posted right there on the box. Or better yet, you can go inside your post office and you can mail any of your letters there. This is NBC 10 at Issue. That does it for this edition of NBC 10 at Issue. I'm NBC 10's Lauren May. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.